about two years ago, I was sitting on the sideline of my daughter Maggie's game, and she's running around here somewhere. She was about six years old. And someone on the team scored a goal, and everyone on the team went and gave her a hug. And then all the girls on the other team gave her a hug. Aww. And all the parents cheered from both teams, and all the coaches are giving high fives. And all I was thinking was, wow, this is what youth sports is supposed to be. The kids are having fun, the parents are having fun, everyone's relaxed and doing great. At the same time, there was another game going on right behind our field. And it was a U10 boys game. And each team somehow had three coaches, all screaming out conflicting instructions. There was 10 parents per team on the other side screaming out conflicting instructions. And the boys are working really hard, but they're running up and down, and, and they're just trying their best, and, and they're getting criticized over and over. Then a goal was scored. And when this goal was scored, the kid who gave the ball away puts his head down. And his mom and dad are yelling at him, and his coaches are yelling at him. And all I was thinking was looking at him going, man, this kid is saying, why do I play sports? Because it just makes people hate me. And as I sat there watching one game and watching the other, I had two thoughts. I said, number one, is anyone on this field that I'm coaching on right now that I'm here with my daughter thinking, man, in three years, that's where I want to be? That's what I want out of sports. And the answer, of course, was probably no. And the second thought was, you know, who's running this gin joint? And then I realized that that was me. <laughs> that it was my club, <laughs> and I wasn't doing anything about this. And so what I did was, at that point, began this two-year journey that kind of gets us to tonight here, which was a, a journey of research and writing and, and reading and finding out everything I could about, well, what really makes for a great experience for kids, and, and, and how can we really change the game for our kids to make it you know, the best one possible? And that got us here. And I don't really look at tonight as sort of the end of the journey. It's kind of the, the end of the beginning. Because really, I think the hard work starts now is not just writing and recording this message, but really spreading this message around the country and, and moving it on. Now, when we were all growing up and playing sports, I think sports was really about mostly children competing against other children. And now, unfortunately, when you look around, a lot of times sports is adults competing against other adults through their children. And that's a really sad thing. And when you bring those adult priorities and those adult values into a kid's game, what happens, as a lot of us here know, is that 70% of kids quit sports by the time they're 13. So three out of four kids are dropping out because they don't like the adult rules and they don't like the adult values. And it's an incredibly difficult thing. And what's happened is, that, that there's really been three main myths that have evolved around youth sports now because of these adult values and because of these adult things. First one is this idea that you have to specialize early. And if you have to specialize early, the, the first time your eight-year-old makes a layup or scores a goal in soccer, all of a sudden you have to say, wow, he needs to specialize in that one sport. That's all he's going to do. We're going to get him to private coaching. We're going to do it year-round. And unfortunately, what the research shows is that specialization leads not to necessarily better players, but it leads to higher burnout, and it leads to twice the injury rate of kids who play multiple sports. And so I always say to people, if, if you went out to a playground and, and there was two, two jungle gyms there, would you send your kids on the one where they're twice as likely to get hurt? Probably not. But that's the path we send out a lot of our kids down. And the second thing is this. The second thing is, because we specialize early, a lot of people think that, well, we're putting all this time, we're putting all this money into sports, we need to be on the winning team. And they think that somehow winning leads to future success. Winning leads to maybe some things, but future success is usually not one of them. Usually what leads to future success is what we call excellence. And excellence is about the process. And we've lost sight in this country on the process of getting better. And that excellence comes from trying and failing and getting up. And sports teaches our kids how to fail and how to get up and how to get better and how to deal with difficulties. So when I have one of my players who, when we first, Emma Momquist, who moved here when you were 10, 11, yeah. Yeah, and, and, you know, and, here, you know, and here's Emma going off to college next year. And I, I think of Emma's whole soccer career from 
times of great success to times of great frustration. And, and, and that's what sports is supposed to be about. But so many people focus on just the winning part of it. And when they don't win, they look at it as a great failure. And then when we combine those two things, specialization and winning, a lot of people say, well, this is now an investment in a future scholarship. We're going to specialize, we're going to get on the best team, and then we're going to get a scholarship. And what the statistics show, unfortunately, is that about 1 in 13 high school seniors actually plays a college sport. And of that 1 in 13, about a, sm a very, very small percentage actually gets financial aid to play a sport. So you have college sports where 1% to 2% of high school seniors get any sort of athletic financial aid. And when they survey parents, 30 to 50% of parents think their kid's getting a scholarship. <laughs> So that's a very dangerous divide. <laughs> and that's what we're trying to overcome here. So how do, we, how do we change these things? Well, I think first of all, the big thing is, is understanding why kids play sports. And there's been some great research on this. University of Notre Dame, Michigan State University have done a lot of work into the realm of why do kids play and why do kids quit? Kids play sports because it's fun. Kids play sports because they like being with their friends. They like wearing the stuff. Kids play sports because they like learning and they enjoy the excitement of competition. In these surveys, they gave 20 reasons. Why do you play? And winning for kids 12 and under came in at number 13. And for kids 13 and up, it made the quantum leap all the way up to number 9. So when you think about your kids going to a game, there are 9 to 12 reasons that they're showing up that day ahead of whether they win or lose. Hi, guys. Come here, come here, come here. You get a seat. You're on crutches. <laughs> Another one of my players when I first moved here. I didn't do that to her, though. <laughs> so there's 9 to 12 reasons why they show up to play that aren't as important as winning. When I think of most coaches, myself included, and I think of most parents, Winning is, is usually much higher in the list than number 9, 10, 11, or 12. Now, why do kids quit? Kids quit because of criticism and yelling. Kids quit because they're bored. Kids quit because of an emphasis on winning. Kids quit because they don't get to play. Lack of playing time. And probably the most phone calls that I take from parents all around the country is my 11-year-old sitting on the bench and doesn't get to play. What do we do? My advice is got to find them some place to play because that's why kids play sports because it's fun because it's play and so if three out of four kids are dropping out of sports in this country right now I think it's a really good sign that there's a lot more of the why kids quit and not nearly enough of the why kids play and we really have to make sports a lot more fun and so that's why I wrote this book and that's why I began this journey into doing that and here's the things that you can do and we have parents here with with kids in, in college going to college younger Remember that the game belongs to the kids. And when we can take the you out of youth sports, when we can take the adults out of youth sports and give the games back to the kids, then, then they start to play again. They take ownership. They take control. They, take enjoy, they, they love it. They learn to communicate better. They gain competence. They grow in confidence. They do all these things when we step aside and let this be this great educational tool and this great learning ground. And when we do this, we'll really change the game. I think that one of the most important things you can do, and this I learned about 10 years ago from a guy who has now become a great friend of mine. His name is Bruce Brown. And I said, you know, Bruce, what, what, uh, what's the best advice you can give me? He said, just tell people to tell their kids I love watching you play. Because when you say I love watching you play, everything changes. And I remember when I was first started write, writing my book, a dear, dear friend of mine came up to me and she said, John, you're writing a book on this. Please give me your best advice. And I said, just tell your kids that you love watching them play. And she kind of laughed at me, and she looks funny. And she's like, really? That's the best advice you got? <laughs> she's like, I love you. You're my friend. But you're not going to sell any books. <laughs> <laughs> so fast forward a year later, and I get this great letter from her about how she decided to actually listen to me and how it's changed her life and, and how it's not only changed how her kids play and how her kids compete, 
but it's changed her whole enjoyment of the whole sports experience. That actually, she thought she was making this change for her kids, and at the end, it really changed everything for herself. So if we're gonna make this change, um, here's my final thought, and then I wanna take some questions, uh, if any of you have them. Um, and, and I had this final thought because today was kind of a sad day, as many of you know, Nelson Mandela died today. And you talk about a person who made massive impact and massive change in the world. Change that people told them, you can't do this, you can't fight this system, you can't, you, you can't change apartheid. And when I travel around the country, I meet so many parents who say, first, oh my God, you have to please come talk to our club, it's a mess. And then they say, wow, this problem's so big though, what can you do about it? So I was reading today, and I have to grab this because it just came up, just came into my inbox right before I came here. And um, one of my favorite authors is a guy named Seth Godin. And Seth Godin um, wrote about Mandela today, and he said, I'm not gonna write about his legacy, but I'm gonna write about what he meant to people who are trying to make massive change in the world. And this is what he wrote. He said, if you learn anything from Mandela, it's this, you can make a difference. You can stand up to insurmountable forces. You can put up with far more than you think you can. Your lever is far longer than you imagine it is if you choose to use it. And if you don't require the journey to be easy or comfortable or safe, you can change the world. So I hope you'll all join me on that mission.